How's everybody doing tonight? I'm good. Well, for me, everything's pretty much all right. Now, now for those who don't know, Vicar a week ago was on vacation for a whole week. Can you believe it? They let me out of this place. And I got a chance to go over to my girlfriend, a chance to go see my family, and my dog, King. Look, King. Well, when I was out there on vacation, I got to see my friends and family and talk about my Vicar. A chance to tell them what's been going on this past year. Overall, things have been pretty good. I mean, I am Pastor Mike's bigger, but you know, it's all good. So I shared how what I've learned from him, what I've learned from Pastor Girl. I share with them what I meant to serve all of you. What all of you guys have done for me right here, my typical answer <coughs> has been, uh, I feel really good here. This is what this past year has done for me. Everything for Vicar is all right. Now when I say that and I think about that, it's easy for all of us to think in our lives that everything's all right. We always think about that. In your job, things are all right. If you work hard, life will be good for you. Take care of your finances, all will be all right. Your relationships, your loved ones, as long as you love them enough, all is good. Yeah, we all realize that things really aren't that right. All right. The scales really aren't balanced. We can look really, we can work really hard in our jobs to be just passed over. We even might even be let go no matter how much work we put into it. Our finances, no matter how much we keep on trying to pay the bills, the debtors keep on calling. Our relationships, we can keep on trying to control things, try to bring people to us, only to push them away. Things aren't always all right. Vicar had to learn this the hard way this week. A reminder when we try to balance the scales ourselves, things don't work out too well. Now, our world knows this. Just about everybody in our world agrees things aren't all right. The balances are off. But here's the kicker. Two-thirds of our world say the only way to get this right, to adjust it, is to fix it yourself. By how you live your life, do good things. That's how things get together. In fact, those who think that way, some of them actually believe there's a God. They actually do believe there's a God. But in order to make things right with Him to balance out, you have to do all these good works. And you never know if you've done a good enough job until you die, and then you're judged. Now, for us Christians, all the other one-third of the world, we have a different story, right? Yes, the world is off balance. Things aren't right. But it's not up to us to fix it. God has his plan. He comes down, sends his son. He dies for us, pays for it on the cross. Life is good, right? But here's the kicker. I know many Christians who don't believe that. In fact, if you talk to them, the most important thing in their mind is if you're a good person, if you live a good life. These are Christians. And if that's the case, what's the point of Jesus dying on the cross? Because if it still takes us to good work, do, do good works to fix the scales, we give actually no power to the uh, crucifixion. We give no power to his resurrection, because who cares if he died, if it's all up to us? Well, our Old Testament reading story today kind of deals in a situation with somebody who thinks they can make the scales even. It deals with Nathan confronting David. But to understand our reading, we have to start with the story right before David and Bathsheba. Now, for many of us, this is a familiar story, and I'm going to really go through quickly with this. you got David. He's the king, right? He sees this beautiful woman bathing, Bathsheba. He likes her. He loves her. So he gets her and sleeps with her. Only one problem. She has a son. So as she has, as she's pregnant, he gets her husband to come from battle, Uriah. Go with your wife. Make it legitimate. He says no. David then sends him back to the front to be killed. Once he's killed, life's good. Marries, brings the right sheep into his household. Life is good. But as we hear this story, don't we in our minds wonder what kind of guilt David is having doing all this? I mean, this guy had a Psalm 23. This is a God's anointed king. 
even us, as we read this story, we think, you know, you heard right here. So when Nathan comes and calls him out, how does David not see this coming? How does David not realize he's really messed up with Bathsheba? And the problem is, when we think about this story, we think about it as Westerners, as Americans. We think about it in a culture where we decide how we feel. Our guilt and our pride determine how we are in society. That's not where David's from. That's not where Jesus is from in this story. In fact, most of the world has a different idea how we determine our wealth, our worth. It's called the honor, shame, honor, community, society. And how this works is, if you do good things and bring honor to your community, your community honors you. But in the same way, if you do things that are shameful, that bring shame on you, then your community brings shame to you. They decide how you feel. So all your decisions that you make are based on an honor-shame society. Kind of like the story of David Bathsheba. If it's in that lens, let's read all through real quick. So we have David. He's the king. David is out there walking around his rooftop and he sees Bathsheba bathing. Now we might ask ourselves, why is a woman bathing on a rooftop? Well, here is the city of David, the time of Jerusalem. It's everything within the upper lines. Jerusalem is on a hill, and where the king is is at the top of it, and the town goes downhill. So the towns are built, the buildings are built up. Now a good, righteous woman who needs to bathe in privacy puts her uh, her her pool, so to speak, her mikvah, her bathtub, on the top of the roof. That way it's out of the sight of everybody around the town. But here's the thing, who's the one person in town, in the towns like this, who has full view of all the women when they bathe? The king. This is not the first time David saw someone, a woman bathing. So he has lust for her, he brings her over to her house, he sleeps with her, he's the king. But then there's a problem. She's pregnant. So David calls Uriah. When we read the story, we think that Uriah is some small little soldier. David has no idea. And calls him out, like, find this guy and bring him out back so he can be of his wife. That's not who Uriah is. The Bible tells us who Uriah is. This is from 2 Samuel. David has an army of thousands and thousands of people. Yet he has 30 very close men. Men that's been with him, fighting with him from the time of Saul. He had three, three very close guys, but then a fourth. And his fourth were charged with these special 30 bodyguards. And on verse 39 here from 2 Samuel, Uriah the Hittite is named. Uriah has been with David in, in, throughout David's reign, through David's times in the desert. He's been by his side. This is a close ally of David. This is who David's, uh, this is the wife of who David uh, sleeps with. So let's think about this now. David has uh, one of his close friends, his wife's pregnant with his child, and his shame on her culture. Now he's the king. Nobody in the right mind would call up the king for doing this. He could kill you, except for one person, the husband. Uriah could call up all of Israel and say, look what the king has done, and shamed David. Now in this culture, if you shame the king, you shame everybody, which means all of God's people would be shamed because of David. That's not good. So David wants Uriah to go to his life, take this baby as yours, so everything's good. Uriah won't do it. David's got a problem. So he fixes it. He hands Uriah this note, go back and serve the army. But unfortunately for Uriah, he was carrying his death sentence as he was sent to die. And once Uriah died, Bathsheba can mourn his death. David takes her into his house. Everything's restored. As far as David's concerned, he's fixed this. Everything is all right because of what he's done. Now this might sound like an episode from House of Cards, because guess what? Things haven't changed that much in 2,000 years. So here comes our reading today. Nathan's got to confront David. Uh, the Lord says to Nathan, go confront the king. 
I told you, if anybody confronts the king on this, they can be killed unless you're the husband. So how does Nathan, Nathan confront, confront David? He tells a parable. He tells a parable of this rich man and a poor man. That's very <coughs> important. In their society, a rich man has honor through, uh, throughout the entire village. Poor man, not so much. Which means if you're rich, if you have power, you don't abuse the poor. That's a shameful act. In fact, the Bible, throughout all of it, the Old Testament, the New Testament, if you're somebody with power, you don't abuse the weak. Well, in this parable, the rich man takes the lamb from the poor man to feed this traveler. The rich man abused the poor man. That brings shame onto the rich man. That brings shame onto the traveler. That brings shame to the whole community that would allow somebody to do something like this. That's why David gets angry. That's why David steps up. Because this man has now brought shame to a village of his kingdom. I swear to God, this man will die. David makes an oath in God saying that that guy needs to be punished. And with that, Nathan turns to him and says, you're the guy. Now the sad part about this story that we read here today is the last part. Because we find out the punishment that he deserves, which is death for this, David's spared. He's forgiven. He will continue to live. But somebody's going to have to pay the price for this. And it ends up being the son of David. This innocent child will be killed. I would love to tell you, but we kept reading that the boy is spared. He's not. On the seventh day or eighth day, he dies. That's sobering, isn't it? I mean, that's hard to hear to read. But that's the point. This idea of sin being separated from God is no laughing matter. We like to make jokes and deal with our lives with it. But the wages of sin is death. Where there's sin, there's death. And throughout the Old Testament, we see how they try to deal with this. Animal sacrifices. Blood is shed. Animals die to make up for the sin of God's people. And as we continue to read the story, we find out what this all points to. What all this death looks up to, and that is the death of Jesus. When we say Jesus died, when we say the son of David died, we're making the point that God decided with all the sin of the world, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it right. And the only way to do that is to do it myself. When we celebrate Good Friday, when we talk about the idea that Jesus died for our sins, we are saying God took that wrath himself. But here's the thing. Anybody can die for another person. I could die for you right now for your sins and tell you I'll die for your sins. How do you know that's true? Well, for us as Christians, we get to say, you know what? He rose from the grave. We get to celebrate to say, you know what? That guy who was on the cross was God. Our sins are forgiven. Things are made right because he is alive. That means that everything that's going on is all right. God makes it so that everything is set, uh, set together. So if you're struggling... Of sin. This is maybe the first time you've ever heard somebody tell you, you know what? You are forgiven what you're dealing with. You are. And I invite you, after service, come talk to me, talk to some of the members here, and learn more about who this Jesus guy is. But here's the kicker. For most of you, you've probably not been listening the last couple minutes. Because you know this, right? Jesus died for my sins. Everything's all right because of him. We grew up with this. We've learned this. You've got a different problem. See, you know the scales are right. Yet you see it right now. You know things aren't all right. There's some sins, some regrets, things that you're dealing with that are right here that are burning you inside. You know Jesus died for you. But you don't live like you believe. 
As we end here today, I have my take home, and this is really made for this issue here. Our take home this week has three devotionals dealing with the issue of what does it mean to actually believe that Jesus died for us. Our first devotional comes from King David, from Psalm 32. David realizes when he holds on to sin himself, he starts to decay inside. He starts to waste away. So that feeling that you have and those sins you're holding on to, David had the same issue. And any time we think we can make those things right, that we can take care of them, all they do is make us die slowly inside. So it's important to realize what's happening, why you're feeling that way. Our second devotional tonight, it comes from our gospel. It's a reminder what happens when we actually receive forgiveness. There's a peace there. For that woman there, she knew she was forgiven, so she showed love. But when you hold on to sin, it's hard to love others. When you hold on to what's inside here, it's hard to share with others who Jesus is. But those who let go of what's going on in their life, those who realize that Jesus died for me, that I truly am forgiven, I can share that with others. There's a peace that forms here that can only come from God when that happens. Our last devotional comes from our epistle reading. Paul explains what this forgiveness does. This forgiveness of Christ is meant for all people. It's not meant for just you and me sitting here in church hearing about this. It's about those neighbors of yours who haven't heard this before. To hear what Jesus has done. That they are forgiven. That there is a peace they have with God because of it. That everything is all right. So this week, as you read through devotionals, I have a challenge for you. On the front of your take-home, I ask you, as you read your devotionals, take time to pray, say this out loud. I am forgiven. For some of you, this might be the first time you've ever said this out loud. For others, this might be the first time you actually said it and realized, you know what? I am forgiven for what's inside. Because in Him, in Jesus, everything is <coughs> Please pray with me.